Welcome to the next lesson, which begins our overview of parallel programming. In this part of the lesson, you'll understand the meaning of key concepts associated with parallel programming, and you'll also learn when to apply parallelism in practice. So what is parallel programming? Parallel programming is a form of computing that performs three phases on multiple processors or multiple processor cores. The first phase is the split phase, which involves partitioning an initial task into multiple subtasks. Ideally, these subtasks are split efficiently and split evenly. And they're also typically split recursively until some threshold is met, at which point no further partitioning takes place. The next phase is the apply phase, which involves running these independent subtasks in parallel on multiple threads mapped to multiple processor cores. Each subtask runs sequentially within its thread and core, but together the aggregate of these subtasks run in parallel on all the threads and cores. And the third and the final phase is the combined phase, which involves merging the subresults from subtasks into a single so-called reduced result. This final reduced result can be a primitive value, such as an int or a double, an object such as a string, or a collection, such as a list, map, or set. A key goal of parallel programming is to partition many tasks into subtasks and then combine the results efficiently. You can therefore think of parallelism as an optimization of various key performance characteristics. For those of you familiar with the famous movie, This is Spinal Tap, parallelism is kind of like turning the amp up to 11. Here are some of the key performance characteristics that are relevant in the context of parallelism. Uh, the first one we'll cover here is throughput which is a measure of how many units of information a system can process within a given time frame. The second characteristic is scalability, which is a measure of a system's ability to handle a growing amount of work. So the system can auto scale as the workload goes up, the system can adapt to it and process it in a scalable way. And the third performance characteristic is latency, which is a measure of the delay between a user's action and a system's response to that action. And the key point here is that parallelism can help improve throughput, scalability, and decrease latency. Now that you know a little bit about parallel programming and parallelism, let's describe when you would want to apply parallelism. Parallelism works best under certain conditions. First and foremost, parallelism works very well when the tasks that are being partitioned and processed are independent of each other. This, these are often known as embarrassingly parallel tasks that have little or no dependency or need for communication between each other, and they don't need to share results until the final reduced result is computed. A good example of this would be going to a laundromat and putting your loads of laundry into multiple washers and running them all in parallel. That's a great example of embarrassingly parallel processing because there's no dependency between one load of wash, wash in one washing machine and another load of wash in another washing machine. Interestingly enough, the word embarrassing in this context means overabundance or too much of a good thing, such as an embarrassment of riches. It's not something you should be ashamed of if you have an embarrassingly parallel programming problem to work on. Another condition under which parallelism works well is when there's lots of data and lots of processing to perform in parallel. There's actually a model called the n times q model that's described at the link at the bottom of this slide, where n is the number of data elements to process, and q is a quantification of the CPU processing intensity. So if n gets big, meaning there's more items, and q gets big, meaning that there's a lot of CPU processing to be done per item, that's the ideal situation for parallelism. In contrast, if you have a small number of items and each item takes very little time to process, then parallel computing may not work effectively for you for reasons that we're going to talk about later in the course. Another condition under which parallelism works well is when threads neither block nor share a mutable state. And I should really caveat that by saying processing operations taking place in threads neither block nor share a mutable state. This is why Java has a focus on work stealing to avoid blocking, because if one thread doesn't have anything to do, it goes ahead and steals work from another thread, and the fork join paradigm, which involves the avoiding of sharing of mutable state by partitioning things up in a way where they don't actually have to be synchronized. Everything can be independent. And of course, the 
Fourth condition under which parallelism works best is when there are many cores and or processors. So the more the merrier. Obviously, if you have dozens of cores, then your embarrassingly parallel processing tasks will run better than if you only have one core or a handful of cores. So that's the end of our overview of parallel programming concepts.